Welcome back to Radio Signals. My name is Mark, and my call sign is N9WIB. This is the Technician License Series, and this is lecture number 20. And today, we will cover safety. This is actually going to be our final lecture in the Technician License Series, so thanks for sticking with us. During the safety lecture, we will review electrical safety, AC grounding safety, lightning protection, radio frequency safety, and finally end with mechanical safety. Electrical safety. Most modern equipment is solid state and low voltage and relatively safe. However, our power supplies and many other pieces of equipment need to still be plugged into AC power and therefore contain household voltage and at 120 volts or so that can still pose a significant threat to life. And another important thing to remember is that older equipment and many amplifiers may contain vacuum tubes, and vacuum tubes contain a very uh, high voltage, so they need to be respected and treated with care. Electrical injury is caused by the flow of electricity or current. Injuries may be dependent on the path taken. For example, if electricity flows from one arm to the other, that can go through the chest and that could potentially cause respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. So as an example, someone may be working on a main electrical panel with one hand and then inadvertently contact a grounded rod or piece of equipment with the other hand and encounter an electrical source that has the current flowing through one arm and out the other. Electrical current follows the path of least resistance, and the path of least resistance in the human body are vessels that contain fluid and electrolyte solutions. Also, nerve and blood vessels are the paths of least resistance within the human body, so electricity will be especially prone to be conducted through these structures. Electricity can cause thermal burns both internally and externally. So if you don't see any significant damage externally, there can still be significant damage inside the body. Electrocution by DC or AC voltage may cause a person to be thrown from a location causing physical trauma. So there's not only a risk of potential respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest or electrocution uh, resulting in nerve and tissue damage and burns, but also physical trauma. So if the patient is on a ladder and gets electrocuted and is thrown off the ladder, they can be injured in other locations. Interestingly, AC is more likely to cause tetany or contractions and ventricular fibrillation and therefore make your heart stand still and go into cardiac arrest. There can be points of entry and exit wounds on a person that suffers an electrocution. So the point of entry were, would be where the person contacts the electrical source and the exit wound would be at the location that the person grounded themselves. Various forms and levels of current will cause uh, various symptoms and processes within the human body. So for example, a relatively low current, 6 to 22 milliamps, may cause muscular contraction and pain. If the current goes up to 18 to 30 milliamps, this may potentially cause respiratory arrest and if the current is increased to 70 to 4,000 milliamps, this can potentially cause cardiac arrest. A general tip when working on electrical equipment is make sure all the electrical equipment is off before working on it. And don't just make this, make, don't just shut the switch off. Confirm that everything is off and there's no power to the device. Confirm that it's off with test equipment. So if you have a multimeter, use the multimeter to actually confirm that there's no voltage or current flowing through the device. And another important thing to remember that be aware that even though the device is off, there could be a residual charge from capacitors which could result in electrocution. For example, on my um, antenna tuner at home, if you turn the power source off, the display, the light on the display does not go off for maybe about a minute because of uh, capacitors within the antenna tuner itself. So it does still contain a residual charge and potentially 
can result in electrocution. So just because a device is off, it may contain things such as capacitors which store charge and pose an electrical hazard. If you want to remove charge from capacitors, use a grounding stick to shunt charge away from the capacitors or probably more appropriately, just allow them to uh, complete their drainage cycle and allow them to completely lose their charge before working on the device. Other ha hazards, storage batteries, if they're shorted, can result in burns, fire, or explosion. And if you're dealing with electricity or fixing something, work with a friend when dealing with high voltage or even household AC current and remove jewelry or any conductive material on your body before working with electricity. And remember that the path of electricity needs a input and also an output, which is a ground. So wear insulating shoes. So if you wear insulating shoes, that is reduces the chance that the electrical current will go from your arms through the ground, through your feet, and into the earth. So it'll reduce the chance of a ground forming. And to reduce the risk further, if you're working on something with your right hand, put one hand either in your pocket or behind your back to reduce the chance of forming a complete circuit and grounding yourself, resulting in potential electrocution. If someone is electrocuted, shut the power source off before approaching the person because you too can get electrocuted if the person is in contact with a high voltage source and there is the ability for you to contact them if you're grounded you can also get electrocuted and another good thing to do is to learn cpr in case somebody does suffer electrocution and is in cardiac or respiratory arrest ac grounding safety so we're going to review some core concepts that everyone should know about typical household and even commercial wiring. The wires in a residential area, the hot wire is black or red, and the white wire is neutral. So hot is black or red, and white is neutral. And there's typically a third wire that's either green or bare. And this wire represents the ground. So hot is black or red, white is neutral, and the ground wire is either green or bare. The ground wire provides a safe path of current in case a short circuit between hot and neutral wire to the chassis or metal enclosure, meaning that if you have an outlet within a metal enclosure and for some reason the black uh, hot wire becomes loose and touches the metal chassis, you could potentially get electrocuted. But if that metal chassis is grounded, that should trip a circuit breaker or fuse to shut off current to that specific circuit. General safety principles, try to avoid using just the two prong uh, devices or extension cords in your house. Use three wire power cords. So the power cords contain a hot, a neutral, and a ground. Uh, use this for all your equipment and use ground fault circuit interrupters when available and know what size wire gauge you're using and the current rating. So let's say you have a project, you really need to know what maximum current will flow through the wire before you pick your wire gauge. And there are tables on the internet that uh, you can find to cross-reference the maximal current rating for the appropriate size wire gauge. It's known as AWG or American Wire Gauge and use a circuit breaker or fuse that does not exceed the current rating of that wire. So if you use wire that has a lower current rating than the actual current that's gonna be drawn through that wire, that's gonna pose a serious safety risk and potentially result in a fire. The same thing uh, will hold if you have a circuit breaker that let's say you have a wire gauge that's rated for 40 amps and for some reason you put a 50 amp circuit breaker in. So if the current through that wire exceeds 40 amps, that can still result in a fire or uh, serious harm to the surrounding area because that current may melt the insulation and cause a fire and that circuit breaker is not going off because it has a higher rating. So you want a circuit breaker that's rated for the maximal 
current flow for that wire or even ideally a little bit below to be safe. So you want the circuit breaker to trip before the current maximum is exceeded of that specific wire. Again, never replace a circuit breaker or fuse with a larger size because that's just asking for problems and you're going to result in a potential fire or other safety hazards. Lightning protection. So with amateur radio operation, we're putting up lots of metal objects, namely antennas, that point towards the sky and are potentially very tall. And lightning could potentially preferentially strike these objects and cause significant damage to your equipment, to yourself, to your house, or even cause a fire. So general considerations are do not operate during a thunderstorm. There could be lightning uh, well away from a thunderstorm that's active. Uh, so any risk of a thunderstorm that's nearby, do not operate. So shut down your equipment and even go so far as to unplug everything in your station when there is a risk for lightning. So physically unplug the coax, physically unplug your station to make sure that there's no damage done to your expensive radio equipment. And of course, all antennas, towers, and antenna masts, as well as mounts, should be grounded. Use a large diameter wire or copper strap to attach to a ground wire for any of those potential devices that could uh, get a lightning strike. Ground connection should be at least as short as possible, so it wouldn't be in your best interest to have a very, very long ground. Uh, that, remember that the wire gauge and length will, a long wire has more resistance, so a shorter wire has shorter resistance. So the path of least resistance is where the lightning is going to go. So if you have a short ground wire, it's lightning is probably going to go to ground and not to your equipment. Install grounded lightning arresters on feed lines before they enter your house. So a lightning arrestor is something different than a ground, but the lightning arrestor is actually grounded. And don't forget to attach or bond all ground rods together. So physically connect them with copper strap or heavy gauge copper wire. Radio frequency interference. This is known as RFI. Amateur radio equipment can be subjected to interference from other devices such as computer monitors, switching power supplies, grow lights, as well as other common household items. Amateur radio equipment can also cause RFI that affects normal household items such as radios, televisions, and phone lines, as well as other devices. The RFI increases when the device power is increased and it's in closer proximity. So if you use more power in your amateur uh, transmissions, that can potentially increase RFI. And the closer the device to the uh, device that's affected, then RFI will increase as well. To combat RFI, you can use filters to reduce or attenuate interference. There are several different filter types they can use. A high pass filter is just that. It allows frequencies above a certain set point to be passed and attenuates frequencies below a certain set point. So it allows the frequency, a high pass filter allows higher frequencies to pass above a certain threshold and starts to block frequencies below that threshold. A low pass filter allows frequencies below a certain threshold to be passed and blocks or attenuates frequencies above that threshold. And finally, there's something called a band pass filter, which takes a small segment or chunk of frequency and allows that to pass while attenuates or reduces the interference above and below that frequency range or inhibits the, the RF uh, energy above or below that certain chunk of frequency. Ferrite is a ceramic magnetic material. It is very useful in suppressing radio frequency interference and absorbing stray RF energy. And ferrite can be formed into various shapes such as a core or beads, which we'll get into a little bit later. 
Ferrite can vary in composition to make it better at absorbing certain frequency ranges. So one composition might be better at absorbing lower frequency ranges, while a different composition of the ferrite can be more effective in absorbing frequencies of areas of a higher frequency instead. As mentioned, ferrite comes in torrids or donut shaped uh, shapes and it also comes in beads which you can actually wrap around a cable or wire. Cables or wires are wound through ferrite rings or toroids to reduce RFI and form chokes. These devices choke off the radio frequency interference. So you can take a donut essentially uh, of ferrite and wind a piece of cable or uh, coax through the ferrite donut several times. You can wrap it around in a coil fashion to reduce the RFI interference. These are some examples of ferrite cores. The ferrite ring or toroid is shown at the left, and that is the device where you can actually turn several uh, turns of coax or electrical cord through the actual ferrite ring and the ferrite beads actually snap onto the external portion of the cable. In general, the ferrite rings or toroids are more effective than the ferrite beads and are used more, more commonly to really suppress uh, radio frequency interference. There are other types of interference called fundamental overload. A receiver can be overwhelmed by nearby strong RF signals. So let's say a consumer, consumer television or radio may not have the ability to block out nearby high-powered amateur radio transmissions. So if you're operating at full legal limits, your television, if it's poorly designed, uh, may not have the ability to block out the nearby radio frequency energy. And for fundamental overload, the interference may occur on all channels or frequencies of the radio, and that's one characteristic finding of uh, a device experiencing fundamental overload. A high-pass filter can be connected to the antenna of a consumer radio or television to allow for higher radio and TV frequencies to be passed while blocking amateur HF lower frequencies, so that might be one solution to the problem. Amateur stations may also experience fundamental overload from other nearby stations or a nearby commercial television or radio broadcast station. Amateur radio transceivers do contain a, a device called an attenuator, which can be turned on, which reduces nearby strong broadcast singles, signals, therefore attenuating those signals. There's other types of interference called harmonics and spurious admissions. Spurious admissions are kind of a broad ranging category of RFI interference in general. Harmonics are created when an RF signal is generated. So you do have the fundamental frequency, the frequency that you do want to create. However, once that frequency is created, you do have smaller intensity signals that occur at multiples above and below the set frequency. Well-built transceivers reduce harmonics as much as possible. Some radios may produce stronger harmonics and cause interference. Spurious emissions are any transmission or undesired RF signal outside a designated frequency. It's just a generic term for interference. And harmonics are spurious emissions. Install a low-pass or band-pass filter between your transmitter and antenna to reduce spurious emissions if needed. Leakage is another form of interference. It is due to RFI to or from a cable television line. The interference may come from the cable television line and cause interference to amateur radio operation on specifically VHF frequencies. External signals can also cause interference within the TV cable line. And leakage is typically most likely due to loose connections, loose uh, coax connectors, or defective coax cable itself.
good practices. So another, one core good practice is to use good grounding and filtering in your station. If you ensure that there is no interference created by radio operation in your own home, it is unlikely that you will cause interference to your neighbors. So if a neighbor comes by and says you are radio stations interfering with their television set or another device, if you're not experiencing that same problem in your own home or shack, then it's unlikely that you'll be causing interference to your neighbor's home or devices unless they're really poorly constructed devices that are more susceptible to interference. So if you suspect your neighbor is causing RF interference uh, to your operation, first look in your own home to make sure that RFI is not coming from your own amateur shack if or other devices within your home. If the interference persists, you can always approach your neighbor diplomatically and ask for their help in finding what the cause of the problem is. Just explain the situation and see if they can help you solve the problem by going through their home and see, seeing if there's any devices that can be causing the RFI. Work with them. Do not blame them. You'll be more likely to get their assistance if you approach them dip diplomatically rather than accusing them of causing interference. And if they're not willing to cooperate or refuse, then you can always remind them that FCC rules prohibit the use of a device that causes harmful interference. So it's actually illegal for one of their devices that potentially can be causing the interference uh, and they, they have to do something about it. Part 15 rules refer to unlicensed devices such as cordless phones, computers, electric fences, and power lines. Any unlicensed device under Part 15 may not cause interference to a licensed communication station. So it's the law that one of these devices cannot cause interference to a licensed communication station. And that licensed communication station is you of, as an amateur operator. Its owner must prevent it from causing interference or cease operation. So if your neighbor's electric fence is causing interference to your amateur station and it's covered under Part 15 rules, they are legally obligated to either correct the problem or cease operation of that electric fence causing interference. An unlicensed device under Part 15 must accept interference caused by a properly operating licensed communication station. So let's say that the uh, cordless phone that falls under Part 15 rules of your neighbor um, is receiving some interference from a properly operating amateur radio shack such as yours, then that device, it's there's no way around it. So it must accept the interference. It's uh, under Part 15 rules. There has been concern in the general public that radio frequency energy causes health risk. However, there is no confirmed link of low-level electromagnetic radiation to health risks. This is something very different than ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation causes ionization or displacement of an electron from an atom and can cause genetic damage. Radio frequency energy is not ionizing radi radiation. RF may cause some injuries by heating tissue and causing burns if with prolonged exposure and to higher power settings, but it is not ionizing, so it's not going to cause cancer. It's not going to destroy tissues by the same mechanism that ionizing radiation does, but it can cause some damage just by normal heating mechanisms. RF energy causes molecules to vibrate, and increased vibration translates into heating, and different parts of the body are more or less susceptible to radio frequency energy and more or less susceptible to the heating associated with RF energy. The FCC put forth a MPE, or Maximal Permissible, permissible Exposure, and this is a limit set by RF by the FCC that is considered safe. When considering safety, we also need to consider power density. Power density is essentially the intensity of the radio frequency field. The amount of energy per unit area and is expressed as milliwatts per square centimeter.
An increase in power translates to an increase in power density. Bringing an object closer to the source of power also increases power density. And power density is lower the farther you are away from the antenna. So if we look at the units, this makes sense. So if there's more power in the numerator, then there is going to be an increased power density. If there is going to be a larger area that the power is spread over, then the power density is going to be lower. However, if the power is more concentrated and the square centimeter area is lower, then that will increase the power density. Absorption of RF energy by the body varies also with frequency, not only body type of tissue, but also with the frequency of RF. So RF intensity and frequency is referred to as a specific absorption rate or SAR. When the SAR or SAR is high, the maximum permissible exposure is low. The human body, interestingly, is actually resonant similar to an antenna. So the human body is generally resonant at 35 megahertz. If not grounded and if grounded, the human body is resonant at 70 megahertz. However, different body parts are resonant at different frequencies. And as we know, resonance translates into greater energy transfer. Another thing to consider when looking at FCC rules is a controlled versus an uncontrolled environment. An uncontrolled environment is the general public or your neighbors. So they are generally not aware of RF exposure and therefore they, they do not make a concerted effort to avoid it. So if you're operating your antenna in your ham radio shack and your uh, neighbors are in the way of your RF transmission, this is an uncontrolled environment and there's going to be different limits for your neighbors as opposed to yourself. And for yourself, you're a amateur radio operator, you're licensed, you know what you're doing, you're going to be in a controlled environment. So people are aware of the RF exposure and can take active steps to avoid it. So you being a amateur radio operator are considered to be in a controlled environment. So you're not going to step in front of your antenna and transmit as opposed to being in an uncontrolled environment where people are generally unaware of the RF exposure that is going on. The maximum permissible exposure is lower for an uncontrolled environment. And this makes sense. So this is a graph put out by, by the ARRL uh, courtesy of the FCC with FCC limits for maximal permissible exposure or MPE. So you can see that the x-axis is frequency and the y-axis is power density. So we can see that there is a uh, dip in the power density that's permissible in the 30 to 300 megahertz range. Increased power density is found below 30 megahertz and generally above the 300 megahertz range. You also need to consider duty cycle. So duty cycle is interesting as well. This was a reference to the, the military originally. So if a soldier was on duty, maybe 12 hours per day, so 12 hours out of 24 hours, that would be considered a 50% duty cycle because he's working 50, he or she is working 50% of the time. So the same can hold true and apply to amateur radio transmission. Duty cycle is the percentage of time a transmitter is transmitting. So let's say you may be on your radio and listening for 60 minutes, but only transmitting a total of 15 minutes out of that 60 minute time frame. So therefore, your duty cycle is going to be the time you transmit, 15 minutes, divided by the whole 60-minute time frame that you're listening, multiplied by 100, and that turns out to be 25%. So the duty cycle for your transmission is 25%. Mode is actually, mode actually has duty cycles as well. If we take into consideration things like Morse code or CW, you're essentially turning the transmitter on and off. So that duty cycle is not going to be 100%. It is going to have a lower, lower duty cycle since signals are on and off. For FM voice, FM voice has a 100% duty cycle while transmitting. And digital modes generally also have a 100% duty cycle while transmitting. 
Single sideband can vary from 20% to 40% duty cycle during transmission. So it's not going to be a 100% or 50% duty cycle. So there may be an increase in a maximal permissible exposure. So you can have a longer exposure to higher power SSB versus uh, FM voice or digital signals. Steps to minimize RF exposure risk use the least amount of power needed to carry on communication. And this is also good amateur practice. You're not going to be transmitting 1500 watts if you're, uh, if you have completely good communication and propagation that you can get away with maybe 50 watts. So you're going to transmit, you're going to turn your power down to the lowest amount that's actually necessary for transmission. And by doing so, you're actually going to reduce your RF exposure risk and RF exposure risk to other people's. Uh, another thing to do in general is to locate your antenna as high as possible and away from people. So you want to locate it as high as possible within reason as well for better transmission, but it also facilitates the RF energy uh, going away from people and being directed towards people. So you don't want to uh, point your beam antenna directly at your neighbor's house. So try to avoid that. And then when it comes to your handy talkie, uh, if you're operating high power, if you use an external microphone, that will also limit your RF exposure. You generally don't want to be transmitting continuously with your HT up to your head or eyes uh, for a very prolonged period of time. Is it going to cause significant damage? No, probably not. But there is uh, some theoretic heating risks. So use an external microphone when possible. Assessing RF exposure rules according to the FCC. So before this year, the FCC did not require formal assessment of RF exposure for amateur radio if they were operating under a certain power and there were tables available. So if you were operating under, let's say, 100 watts for a certain frequency, you could have been excluded from doing a formal assessment of your RF exposure. However, this has changed as of May 3rd, 2021, at the time of this recording. Now, each amateur needs to document an assessment of RF exposure and provide it to the FCC if asked to do so. So you don't have to do your assessment and then formally send it to the FCC. You only need to have it kind of in your back pocket or stored someplace in your file cabinet or computer that if for whatever reason, if the FCC comes to your home or your shack one day and asks for your RF exposure access assessment, you can provide it to them. But this is going to be highly unlikely unless you're doing something to cause spurious admission emissions or interference. Uh, but just the same, you should do it. It is part of the FCC rules. So you should conduct a FCC RF exposure assessment for each frequency and power you are transmitting on, actually the, the maximum power. So if you're not going over that and you're below the maximal permissible exposure, you should be fine. So if you're operating on 20 meters, you need to document a RF assessment on 20 meters at the certain power setting. And you also need to do this for any amplifiers you put in or any new antennas. So just make sure you can have that on hand. And you don't have to do this by hand, per se. There are tools online that are available through a Google search or through the AWRL that assist with calculating the maximal permissible exposure. Things you need to know are the distance of the antenna from the person or any persons at risk, the gain of the antenna, the signal frequency. Again, are you operating 2 meters, 20 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters? What are you, what are you operating? And also the average power at the antenna and determine if it's a controlled or uncontrolled environment. You're going to have to do that for, you know, other people's exposure, neighbors risk and yourself. So again, you must do this for each band, power level and antenna you are using. Now, take note of the average power level. Average power level is not peak envelope power. So it's not the, you're not setting your radio to 100 watts and then you're doing the assessment for 100 watts. It's actually the PEP or peak envelope power uh, 
multiplied by the operating duty cycle. So that's going to reduce things right there. And also multiplied by the transmit duty cycle. So for example, let's say you have your radio set to 100 watts peak envelope power and you're operating single sideband. Single sideband only has a 20% duty cycle. And then you're transmitting only half that time. You might be listening for 30, for 60 minutes and you might be transmitting for 30 minutes. So doing the math, 100 watts multiplied by 0 0.2 is the operating duty cycle for SSB multiplied by 0.5 which is the transmitting duty cycle yields a average power of 10 watts. So you just went down from 100 watts operation to 10 watts. And if you want to reduce that even lower, you should also consider losses in the feed line. So if you have about 200 feet of coax going out to your HF antenna, there are online calculators out there that you can actually calculate the power reduction from your transmitter to the antenna. So that will actually get you even to a lower average power. Mechanical safety. Place antennas as high as possible and away from people. They should not be able to contact the operating antenna. For example, if you have your six-year-old nephew over, don't have a Yagi three feet off the ground, and then we're at an area where your nephew is going to be able to stand right in front of the transmitter the, and receive the full RF energy from the antenna. And also ensure that all dipoles or ropes are well above the height of any person that could potentially encounter them. So this means that you should probably put dipoles or secure ropes at least 8 to 10 feet above ground level and secure them to other things such as a building, a pole, or even a tree. Because you don't want people walking into your dipole inadvertently and then uh, potentially causing a injury to their head or torso. So along the same lines, mark all guy wires with towers or long masts with flags, reflective tape, or bright outside plastic coating to prevent a person from walking into them. So if there's no way around it and you need guy wires, make sure they are clearly marked so someone doesn't ride by in a bike and, and uh, clothesline themselves on the guide wire. And another important thing is do not place antennas above or below power lines or very close to power lines. I actually had to move my antenna setup when we moved our main service line to the house. So my dipole antenna would have crisscrossed the power line. So I actually had to physically remove the dipole and reposition it because we had to reposition our main service uh, line to our, our home. Vertical antennas should be placed about 150% of the total height of an antenna away from power lines. Minimum is 10 foot clearance if a fall occurs. So this means that if your antenna is 100 feet and you can just kind of watch it fall to the ground for whatever reason, that power line should be well away from the distance that antenna could potentially fall. So if it's 100 feet, you need to do a little bit of uh, geometric calculations, but make sure that antenna will not contact a power line if it falls over. And you need a little bit of wiggle room for that. So 150% uh, would be appropriate or a 10 foot clearance. Towers should be secured with guy wires. You don't want to put up a tower that's freestanding and requires guy wires per the instructions of the manufacturer and not do this. This would not result in a very stable tower and your tower would be at risk for falling over, injuring yourself, injuring property or other things. And you also want to remember to place a safety wire through turnbuckles used to tension guy wires to prevent them from loosening. And most importantly, if you live near an airport and you decide to put up a tower, you need to be careful about your tower height and location. So you don't want your tower to be put up at the beginning of a runway and obscure the flight path of an aircraft coming in or departing the airport. You need to consult local regulations, FAA rules on distance and maximal um tower height for your location relative to your proximity to the airport.
And with respect to electrical safety, each leg of your tower should be grounded to a separate eight foot long grounding rod and all should be bonded together. So what does this mean? If you have a tower with three legs, then you need three separate eight foot grounding rods placed into the ground and attached to each leg of your tower with heavy copper wire or copper strap. And then each of those grounding rods needs to be connected together with heavy copper, heavy gauge wire, or a copper strap. If you decide to put up a tower yourself or invite your friends over, just remember that there are some safety tips and rules. Climbers and ground crew should wear helmets, safety glasses, boots, and gloves, as well as other appropriate safety equipment. Never climb a tower alone. You don't want an accident to happen, a fall, or something else, and no one be there to assist you or call emergency services. So invite your friends over. They don't necessarily have to be hams. You can even get your family members to come out there and keep an eye on you in case something happens. And remember to inspect tower and guy wires before climbing. You don't want to climb a tower with a loose guy wire or a tower that is rusty at the base and, and is going to fall over at any second. So make sure the tower is intact before you actually decide to physically get on it and climb. And use appropriate safety harnesses, fall arresters, and rope when climbing. And make sure everything's appro approved as well as intact. So you don't want to use a 20-year-old rope that you found on your farm. You want to use an approved rope for climbing purposes. And make sure you inspect all your other gear as well before starting your project. You don't want to discover that your harness has a tear in it um, five minutes before you start climbing your tower with about 10 of your friends over it to help you. You want to make sure that all this is done beforehand so you can smoothly complete your project. And obviously do not work on towers when there is a risk of thunderstorms or high winds in the vicinity. And disconnect all power to antennas and lock out the transmitter so you don't climb the tower and one of your friends inadvertently press the transmit button and send 1500 watts through the antenna that you're working on. Mobile operation safety. So make sure all your equipment within your vehicle is secured. So a lot of the time nowadays, your head unit and your main body of your VHF, UHF transceiver are separate units. The body being the larger, more heavier object that you could secure either underneath your seat and tie it down or someplace else in your car. So you don't want that thing loose when you have to decelerate rapidly or if you get into a car accident, that could uh, soon become a very dangerous hazardous object flying through the air that could potentially hit you in the head or hit your passenger in the head or hit glass and cause shattering or some other type of damage. You also want to place the radio head in an accessible location does not distract or obscure your vision of the road while driving. So the actual control unit the, where you actually tune things in and uh, identify frequencies or squelch or volume, you want to make sure that it's right directly in front of you and not uh, in near the floorboards or you have to actually look down and look away from the road. But you also don't want to have it in the center of your windshield or console where it's going to obscure your view of the road as well. Uh, so have it in a convenient location where you don't have to look all over the car for it and have it in an area where it does not obstruct your field of vision. And if you really need to perform more complicated things like changing the menu or shifting to a different frequency that's not easily done, then pull over to perform these things and don't do this while you're driving. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for our actually last session of the Technician License Series. So we hope you learned a lot about safety, electrical, RFI, and mechanical safety, as well as RF exposure limits.
So this, with this, we hope that you'll be able to go ahead and take your technician exam and pass and become one of the next ham radio operators. So welcome to the hobby, and we hope you can join us soon. Don't forget to go to radiosignals.org if you'd like to support us and make sure we can continue our efforts at ham radio education. Thanks, and 73, and as usual, have fun.